Good evening. Welcome to MindFunda. My name is Suzanne van Doorn. I have a blog on MindFunda.com and a YouTube uh, site. And you can subscribe to my YouTube site so I'll, because I'll be uploading lots of interesting interviews. And tonight I have the honor of uh, talking with Evan Thompson. And he wrote a terrific book. And it's about a question that we all have that little voice in our head. Where is it? Is it to be found somewhere? What is the eye that you conceive when you are sleeping or meditating or dreaming or walking or having an argument with your man or husband or wife? And uh, his book was so intriguing that I invited him to uh, be my guest on Mindfunda. Hello, Evan. Good Hi. evening. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Would you do the, us the honor of introducing yourself? Yes, I'm Evan Thompson and I teach philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I work <clears throat> in the areas of philosophy of mind and cognitive science, the sciences of mind and brain, and have a great interest in Asian philosophy, Indian and Buddhist philosophy. And I try to bring these things together in my book, Waking Dreaming Being. Yes, and in that way you have uh, tried to build a bridge between the ancient Eastern philosophy and the modern uh, neurological uh, science, as um, a marriage between science and religion. Um, first of all, the frame of your book uh, consists of uh, building that bridge between the wisdom of the Abhidharma school of Buddhism and the latest neurological findings of consciousness. And you're carefully uh, you carefully research in the book Waking Dreaming Sleeping, Waking Dreaming Being, sorry, uh, the four states of consciousness, the waking state, the dreaming state, the dreamless sleep, and a state of pure awareness. And after reading your book, I'm very impressed by all the research you've done and the research uh, which you, and the care with which you present your research. How has this book changed your view of yourself? Mm. Well, I would say that the exploration of writing the book changed how I relate to my own dreaming and sleep because I did a lot of um, close attention to my own sleep patterns and my own dreaming and lucid dreaming in the course of writing the book because I wanted the book to have a personal voice as well as yeah. a philosophical and scientific voice. So it brought me uh, into a much closer relationship with those things in my own life on a, in, in the day-to-day -day rhythm of waking and, and going to sleep and, and dreaming. I had always been interested in those things, but especially when I was intensively in the writing of the book, I really paid much more close attention to those things. And that's really stayed with me after the writing. Um, it's, it's, it's something where, you know, many of us, we just go to sleep and that's the end of the day and we don't really, you know, think about it any further. Um, but I really um, found that I have kind of an ongoing interest in, in that whole cycle of the rhythm of the day as a result of, of writing the, 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 the stories and narrative of those parts of the book. Mm -hmm. But um, did you find other aspects of yourself because of writing the book? Things you haven't discovered before? Well, I would say that um, the one thing that comes to mind is that I had always maybe not always, but for a while had been um, a lucid dreamer mm -hmm. and that increased a lot as a result of writing the book. Um, and so that has changed my dream life, um, but also changes my relationship to how I think about consciousness because that's a very interesting state in which you can observe the way that your mind imaginatively creates images and thoughts and that's much more uh, prominent in my life as a result of, of writing the book. Yes, and it's a sort of an intermediate uh, state between uh, waking and dreaming, isn't it? Well, I would say that it's, um, 
it, you could think of it as an intermediate state in that it has qualities of being awake and qualities of dreaming. But I think of it as, in a way, a unique state that's not really between the two, but it's but it's a unique third mode of awareness. Okay. Because because precisely because you're dreaming. Um, but you have this very vivid consciousness that you're dreaming, and um, that makes it have a very special feel, very particular quality. Okay, very interesting. Um, your book tries to build a bridge between science and religion. Um, the, it starts with the most ancient map of consciousness, the Upanishad wisdom, and the current neuro neurological research. Well, your father, William Irwin Thompson, founded the Lindis, Lindis Farm Association. Sorry, I, I wasn't aware of that. I've looked it up on the internet. That's why <laughs> right. I'm stumbling a bit about That's it. That's all right. But you were raised in a very philosophical surrounding mm -hmm. with your father being mm -hmm. challenged in that way. Your, your, your clever mind was, was challenged from... Uh, day one, day one, when when you were raised that way, and you were discussing with other scholars uh, things about philosophy, consciousness, awareness, and then you met your wife, and she's a, a very well-known uh, neurologist, Rebecca Todd, mm -hmm. and I, as far as bridges, I see this book as a bridge, maybe between the ancient wisdom that your father brought to you and the new wisdom your wife brings to you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a nice way to look at it. It's um, it's a book that combines my, you could say my, you know, professional, academic, or let's say my scholarly interests, mm -hmm. and my personal life and. Um, that means that there's a strong influence that my f that my father plays in the book from my early childhood and upbringing, and also um, my wife Rebecca, who is a neuroscientist, and so a lot of what I write about neuroscience, I I asked her to read and I got her perspective on, and there's a part of the book where we describe going to a retreat at the Upaya Zen Center that's um, called Being with Dying, that's for end-of-life care, and she participated with me in that. And so she's definitely present in the book in, in, in many ways, especially through the, through the neuroscience and my, um, I suppose you could say, writing the neuroscience in a way that then I could get her reaction to, because I, I wanted her reaction both as a scientist, but also she's very good at um, at catching when the, the personal story might um, need to be um, told in a more accessible way in relationship to the science. So she read everything that I wrote more than once and, mm -hmm. and helped a lot with the book, yeah. Okay, oh, that's nice. Um, uh, the waking state. Um, you start with uh, uh, will, uh, citing William James, uh, one of the most famous uh, psychologists, who um, uh, has uh, coined the term the stream of consciousness. And in your book, you tell us that the research has shown that awareness comes and goes, leaving gaps. What happens during such a gap? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so there I distinguish between two aspects of consciousness. One is, you could say, the moment-to-moment -moment perceptual awareness where you um, see something and you recognize it or you hear a sound or your attention jumps from one thing to the next. And a lot of research in neuroscience, and this connects with older Buddhist ideas, is that that is a kind of discrete sequence of processes so that there's a stream in William James's sense but it's where you have one thing then another thing then another thing and it's gappy so then another sense of consciousness is that larger sense of you could say background awareness that's still present in the gaps because you're awake so you're conscious in the sense of being awake and being alert and able to shift your attention and one of the things that's interesting about meditation practice, or at least certain kinds of meditation practice, is that it encourages you or invites you or trains you, you could say, to become more 
aware of that background awareness, that larger background space of awareness that's always, you could say, conditioning in certain ways and, and being affected by the more discrete moment-to-moment -moment jumps in attention and jumps in awareness. So the short answer to the question would be that from one perspective at any rate, what's between the gaps is a kind of larger background awareness. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, you, you could think of it as a bit like um, there's a way in which you, you move attentively from one thing to another, but in, be, in being able to move in that way, there has to be some kind of background um, um, posture that you have that enables you to, to move in one direction or another. So that would be one way that, that I, would, I would describe it. I think from a neuroscience perspective, so that's a more phenomenological way of describing it. Um, from a neuroscience perspective, there's less work maybe that's been done on that, let's say, more continuous sense of background awareness that, that provides the larger context for the moment-to-moment -moment awareness, except in the case of waking, transitioning into sleeping, and dreaming, because that's this larger awareness that moves across these, these different, more global states. Okay. Okay, very interesting. Um, in the dreaming state, you um, talk about lucid dreaming as a very special form of awareness, because there's a third-person perspective. The I is not only acting and believing, but it also has a third person perspective, you look at yourself in a lucid dream and contemplate what you are going to do next. Um, the question was, are you a lucid dreamer yourself? But you already told us you are a lucid dreamer. Uh, what has a lucid dreaming taught you about consciousness? Well, I would say that one of the things that lucid dreaming makes especially vivid is how so much of consciousness is shaped by the imagination. Mm -hmm. So the imagination is, you know, our capacity to to generate images, to generate thoughts, to to remember our past, to project ourselves into the future. That all requires imagination. And in lucid dreaming, what happens is you have that imaginative capacity working in a way that's less immediately tied to your perceptual environment. It, it, it still is, of course, tied to it because you're asleep and in the bed and you still have body sensations and, and things like that. But, but you're, in a way, um, a little bit looser in your relationship to it. And yet the mind is still, and the brain, is still highly active generating these images based on memories and associations. And so lucid dreaming makes that that very vivid, that our consciousness is very much a matter of imagination, of, of creative, generative activity, you could say. Okay. Did, did you start um, visualizing more when, when you um, enhanced your capacity to lucid dreaming? Well, one of the things that many people, and, and this would be true in my own experience as well, many people report in lucid dreaming is that lucid dreams have a um, very um, vivid sensory quality, mm -hmm. or some some kinds of lucid dreams have a very vivid sensory quality. So that when you become you're aware that you're dreaming, all of a sudden the sensory quality of the image becomes much sharper and and more vivid. And it's interesting um, why that would be the case, but I think it very much has to do with the combination of attention and imagination that's in play in the lucid dreaming state. We know that attention in general makes something more vivid yes. and when you become aware that you're dreaming um, all of a sudden the dream imagery is is directly what's available to you atten attentionally in a way where you know it's a dream and so it becomes quite um, quite vivid. But there can be lucid dreams where the where the imagery actually dissolves and you just have a kind of awareness yeah. of being in a sleep state um, without that kind of sensory imagery. So by imagination, I don't just mean sensory imagery. I mean the, um, the generative power of the mind to create content for itself, you could say, sometimes in the form of sensory images, but sometimes in the form of thoughts. And then lucid dreaming can be a passageway into another kind of awareness where you can watch that dissolve and yet still have a sense of a kind of clear awareness 
that is at least phenomenologically in some way more, um, it feels more basic than the images that might be generated um, that, that change from moment to moment. Okay, and a friend of mine who's also a lucid dreamer once described these voids that can um, mm -hmm. be in, in um, after you have a lucid dream, sometimes the dream um, results in a kind of void where you wait mm -hmm. till something new happens. Yeah. It, could that be the same void as the gaps between the consciousness? It's, <laughs> it's, it's possible. It um, would be beautiful. It, it, yeah. It's possible. Um, it's tempting to think that yeah. that's the case. Certainly in some practices of lucid dreaming and lucid dreamless sleep, the idea is that you can enter into a kind of dreamless sleep through letting the dream imagery dissolve. The trick there is that when that happens, sometimes you'll just wake up. So you have to find a place where the imagery can dissolve without your waking up and there's still a kind of... Um, sense of basic awareness present and that yeah. that could very much be um, what's involved in what Indian contemplative traditions describe as as lucid dreamless sleep yeah yeah and um, how have you um, explored your uh, own sense of identity in lucid dreams um, I'm not it depends what you mean I, I well, would say that Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, I've been in lucid dream. I've, I've wanted to be a man. So I, I, I explored myself as being a man. Yeah. And I wanted to be energy. So I explored that part of myself. And I wanted to be a, a plant one, mm -hmm. one day, uh, one night, I, I have to say. And uh, I was wondering, somebody with your philosophical uh, background, have you done the same? And what conclusions have you reach yeah a, a little bit I've done I've done some things like that it's it doesn't tend to be where I kind of naturally go in the course of lucid dreaming it's it, it's very much something I'm familiar with because because people as you you just did describe that and that for me speaks to the difference between the image that we can create of self and the sense of awareness that is the awareness of the image. So it's yeah. it's a bit like the distinction between the dreaming awareness and the dreamed awareness or the dreamed um, sense of self. So so that I think is a is a kind of basic structural feature of lucid dreaming, the difference between the awareness of the dream and then whatever the content of the dream happens to be. It's not something that I've that I've been drawn to as much myself. I'm more not for any particular reason, I suppose, I just more naturally tend to um, try to explore the quality of the awareness itself without making myself into a particular thing. Um, but that's just my own tendency, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm more, I tend to, I tend to take a more, um, uh, you could say, observational kind of attitude in the in the dream trying to simply watch whatever whatever comes up in the course of in the course of the of the dream without deliberately making myself into one thing or another okay. um, but that's just my own my own style really mm -hmm. so you you are kind of naturally drawn to the third person perspective i wouldn't say it's third person necessarily because it's okay. not necessarily as if i'm outside myself mm -hmm. looking Self, but a, but a more observational perspective, you could okay. say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the official scientific standpoint of is that uh, dreaming is the neurological chatter of the brain. What are your thoughts on dreaming? Ah, well, as you say, the, the the sort of standard neuroscience view is that it's random chatter that's kind of hallucinatory. And my own view is that it's not really accurate to think of the dream state that way. I think of the dream state as a state of imagination and of, you could say, spontaneous imagination. Spontaneous in the sense that there's a um, generation of something from moment to moment that's not um, at least experientially being strictly 
determined by um, by the thought that you might have or by something that you might feel. It has its own kind of life, you, you could say creative creative life. And that seems to me very much the way the imagination is when we when our minds wander or when we daydream or when we try to let our minds float or drift in order to come up with a kind of new insight or novel um, solution to a problem in, as people do in, in what's called insight problem solving. So I would say dreaming is more like that. It's more of an imaginative state and it's one in which our attention Whatever we're experiencing in the dream has to do with where our attention is going. And that's very much also like imagination. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of it, in short, as a kind of state of imagination, not a, not a kind of state of, as some neuroscientists describe it, delusional hallucination that's, that's basically random. And it's clearly not random in lucid dreaming experientially in the sense that in a lucid dream it becomes very apparent that although you can't control the dream absolutely, you can certainly... Um, you can certainly direct or guide it through your own thought processes. And so it has an intentional quality that um, makes it also not random. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, dreamless sleep. Uh, in the absence of consciousness, you still assume that there is a spirit. In that way, the book breaks with the neuro-reductionist view of consciousness. We are being beings beyond our brain. Your book seems like a love letter to this fourth, fourth pure state of awareness. Have you ever have experienced this pure state of awareness? I don't think I could say that I've experienced it um, on its own terms or in the ways that certain contemplative philosophical traditions describe it, but I would say that I have had experiences in dreaming and lucid dreaming and meditation that are, you know, I suppose you might say, tastes of it or suggestions or hints of it. Hints might be a better word. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how it feels experientially. Um, I wouldn't say, I, I don't in my book describe it in terms of spirit as opposed to consciousness. I describe it as really just the nature of awareness or awareness itself distinct from the changing contents of awareness. And I, I think of it as something that um, is beyond the brain in the sense that it involves our whole sentient being, not just the brain. I don't think of it as beyond the brain in a kind of uh, dualist or spiritualist sense where it would be an independent spirit that would have a life independent of the body. Um, I talk about that issue when I talk about near-death experiences and some other things in the book. So I'm, I'm skeptical of that, or at least the, the, the evidence that people put forward to try to argue for that, I, I don't find convincing. So in that sense, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word spirit, but in an older sense of the word spirit, where spirit means our whole, um, our whole alive existence, um, our whole being, then, uh, then you could use the word spirit in that sense, I suppose. Yes. Mm -hmm. And is that pure awareness? Is that a sort of a Kundalini experience? Kundalini is well. Kundalini is not something that I talk about in my book. Sorry, my phone's ringing. I'm just turning it off here. Um, so the 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 topic of Kundalini is is. Not really something that I deal with in the book. The whole um, topic of bodily energies, I suppose, is an, is an interesting one in relationship to these different mental states. Yeah. But I, I would think of that as more the, the kind of subtle felt energies in the body that condition our awareness, whether we're awake or asleep or dreaming. And I wouldn't identify that with pure awareness. No, I would okay. say that it's part of the... the um, I suppose the energetic life of the body and mind is described by some traditions in, in you know, with concepts like kundalini or chi in a Chinese tradition, and that's that's um, definitely something that that uh, those traditions would link to changing qualities of awareness. But uh, I wouldn't, or you might say that they're. The energetic side or aspect of awareness, but I wouldn't. It wouldn't work to just equate them as the same thing. Okay. Um, what caused you to pick up the pen 
and to write waking dreaming being? <laughs> uh, that's a nice question. Um, I would say that the, the real trigger for writing it was a lucid dream that I had and it was the first really strong lucid dream I had and I had it when I went to India also for the first time for a meeting that I talk about in the book with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala and it was a meeting in which there were scientists and Buddhists together talking about the plasticity of the brain, how the brain changes itself through experience and I was the philosopher who was there for the meeting and the night that I arrived in Dharamsala after you know long travel from Toronto to Germany to Delhi to Dharamsala with a 10 hour time difference so my whole sleep cycle had been altered I went to sleep and woke up maybe three or four in the morning with this very very vivid lucid dream and it was one of the strongest Lucid. I had had some dreams with lucidity before, but this one was really the first very, very vivid one that I had. And I took it as kind of an omen, that a good omen, that, um, that I had made this trip and that I had this dream that stimulated me to think about dreaming and consciousness. And I knew, of course, that there was a Tibetan tradition of dream yoga and dream uh, sleep yoga. And so in writing down the dream in the middle of the night, I started writing what eventually became Waking Dreaming Being. And, and so that's, that's how it started. Oh, wow. What a great story. <laughs> and do you know if, if the Dalai Lama himself is a lucid dreamer? Or does I don't know. Yo I, yoga? I don't know, actually. No. no, I don't know. Okay. Why should people read uh, Waking Dreaming Being? <laughs> well, I suppose my hope for the book is that people who are interested in how science relates to um, philosophy of mind and the study of consciousness and who are interested in the relationship between the science of the mind and Indian and Buddhist philosophy would be drawn to it, but then in reading it that they would find things that would... Um, change their relationship to their own experience, especially in sleeping and, and dreaming. I think that if if people find in the book new ways of relating to their own dreams or their own um, process of falling asleep and waking up, that that would be... Um, that would be the most valuable thing from the book, I suppose, to take from the book. Not any particular idea or argument, but new resources for appreciating your own experience in, in new ways. Wow. Well, the thing that I really loved about reading it was um, uh, being um, a dreamer, that it gives such so much clarity in uh, thoughts about... Um, that, that voice in my head that I always conceive as being Susan mm -hmm. and the voice that looks out for me and the voice that whispers in my head, mm, don't trust this, mm, that's bad for you, or being a diabetic, the voice that says, there's something weird going on, eat, eat now, that uh, there's so much uh, perspective in, in your book that uh, gives you um, a reason to really logically think about it. Ah! Ah! Now I get it. Oh, that's a new perspective on it. And I thought that was terrific. And I think that's the reason why people really, really should read your book. Mm, well, thank you very much. It's very nice to hear. Thank you for your time. And I have enjoyed the interview very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye.